In this video, we're going to look at theories of mate selection, specifically homogamy, propaguity, socialization theory, systems theory, exchange theory, stimulus value role theory, and complementary needs theory. Homogamy theory states that we tend to be attracted to people who are similar to ourselves in such characteristics as age, race, religion, and social class. It has to do with homogamy, which is marriage within the same social class or the same educational level, and endogamy, which is marriage within the same ethnic group or the same religious groups. We need to ask the question, is there evidence to support homogamy theory? Let's look at social class homogamy first. Would you be prepared to marry someone in a different social class? than yourself? Americans love books and movies that depict the super-rich falling in love with and marrying the poor. But in the real world, in real life, that almost never happens. Uh, one study in the UK found that the upper class are 40% more likely than the working class to not engage in a relationship with someone in a different social class. So I've got a bumper sticker that says, if you're rich, I'm single, which means that, you know, the poor might be more willing than the rich to engage in that relationship. But it takes two for it to happen. Prior to 1967, it was illegal in many states for people of different races to marry. But the case of Loving versus Virginia changed that and made it legal nationwide. So in the first half of the last century, only 3% of newlyweds were intermarried. But in recent years, such as in 2015, we see 17% of newlyweds were married to someone of a different race. Would you be opposed to someone in your family marrying outside of their race? Well, let's look at some survey data where people were asked that exact question. And you can see that prior to the year 2000, there were higher percentages of people that agreed with the statement that they would oppose their family members marrying outside of their race. But by the year 2016, the trend had moved downward so that a far fewer percentage of people opposed those interracial marriages. For example, when non-whites were asked in 1990, if they opposed their relatives marrying blacks, 63% said they did. But by 2016, only 14% indicated that they opposed it. Rosenfeld examined data regarding endogamous trends over the past 100 years. And as you can see, with regard to racial endogamy, the trend has been for there to be less and less opposition to interracial marriage. However, with regard to uh, educational uh, status, there has not been much change. People tend, still tend to marry others that have about the same level of education as they do. And there hasn't been as much change with regard to marrying outside of one's religion. Okay, that brings us to propaguity theory. This theory states that you're most likely to marry someone that you live near, work with, or go to school with. So it's all about how geographically close you are to other people and therefore have more interactions with those people and you're more likely to marry them. I wonder if new, more recent data would show a change in this trend um, with the advent of online dating, where people from more further distances apart could actually meet, get to know each other, and perhaps finally meet up and get married. Socialization theory focuses on how parental influence affects mate choice. The image of the opposite sex parents guides the search for a mate, and the same sex parents provides a role model. This reminds me of an old song from 1911.
So it would appear that socialization theory was in the minds of the public back at the turn of the century. There have been some studies that have found that mixed race children are more likely to choose a mate that is the race of their opposite sex parent. So that gives a little bit of evidence or credence to that theory. That brings us to systems theory, which maintains that there's a connection between the social role which people play in their family of origin and the kind of mate they select. So according to this view, there's a tendency for people to gravitate toward partners with whom they can reenact their childhood family roles. I don't know if it's so much the case that they seek out people to do that, or if they simply expect that once you get married, that that's what you're going to do. I'll give you an example. Suppose uh, a young man and a young woman get married, and let's say the young man comes from a family that's very demonstrative, that they're always kissing and hugging, kissing hello, kissing goodbye, and they're very affectionate. And the young woman comes from a family that's a little more reserved. You know, they, they kiss and hug in private, and they are affectionate, but they tend to be a little more reserved in public, and they're not always kissing hello and kissing goodbye and so on. But during the time that the couple is dating, they are very much engaged in kissing and hugging and all of that, you know, as a part of the mating ritual. So after they get married, and they've been married for a little while, the husband kind of reverts back to the roles which he's observed in his family of origin, where they were accustomed to the kissing and hugging, and the wife tries to revert back to the roles she had observed in her family of origin, where they were a little more reserved with regard to that. And then they begin, the husband begins to think there's something wrong with our marriage. My, my wife doesn't love me anymore because she doesn't kiss me anymore in public or what have you. And really it's not that she doesn't love him anymore. It's simply that she's reverting back to that pattern that she learned. So in a, in a context of uh, marriage and family therapy or counseling, the counselor might help the couple to recognize that that tendency and where that comes from and then help them decide for themselves how they want their family to be, uh, and it might be different from their families of origin. This brings us to exchange theory. Exchange theory postulates that enduring love and attraction are most likely to emerge when the, each person perceives an advantageous exchange of contributed and received resources. So what are these resources? We call them in sociology social capital. It could be beauty. It could be a good personality. It could be a good family background. It could be wealth. It could be um, any number of things that we value in the other person. And, and so exchange theory says when you kind of perceive an equal amount of that or, uh, and, you know, or maybe you feel like you have a little bit of a better uh, end of the deal for that, then you're more likely to uh, fall in love and get married. And you know that you believe exchange theory because think back when you were maybe in high school and you saw two people dating and they didn't seem to fit together, right? Maybe they were from the wrong, one, from different family backgrounds or social classes or what have you. And you were like, and people would say, oh, he's, he's not good enough for her. You know, he's not good enough for her or she's not good enough for him. So people would predict that their relationship wouldn't last because they were basically using exchange theory to size up their assets and compare them. So you might observe a lot of cases where you think exchange theory kind of works as an explanation of how those couples fit together. But how do you explain this? Ugly man and pretty woman. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily think that Lyle Lovett is so much of ugly man, but certainly the folks in the entertainment industry or the media, or at least the National Enquirer, uh, questioned that couples getting together on the basis of, well, exchange theory. 
Complementary needs theory suggests that individuals choose mates who provide them with maximum need gratification. What that means is that their needs are not the same. They might be different, but they are complementary. You might have heard the nursery rhyme, Jack Spratt could eat no fat and his wife could eat no lean. And so together between them both, they lick the platter clean. I'll try to give you an example. Suppose you have a couple where one person has a dominant personality and feels a need to be in control and make most of the decisions, and then the other person in the relationship has the opposite. They are more of a passive personality and they have a need for someone else to take charge and to make the decisions. So that might fit the complementary needs model. So we've talked about some theories of mate selection. Which one makes the most sense to you?